Google's a search engine which has evolved in the last decade or so to be, the, I guess, the number one place we go for information. If I want to know something, no longer do I go to the library. Perhaps I don't even ask my friends. I just ask a little box, a series of uh, words, and it will give me the information that I need. And so search, um, the search industry has built around Google. Um, and over the last few years, Google has done certain things which have um, raised eyebrows, certainly in our, in our industry, um, but also in the wider context of how we, we view Google and how we use it. So my talk here is about how SEO has evolved. Um, SEO is search engine optimization, one of the ways that you can get your website to rank highly on Google or Bing or Yahoo um, by doing certain things. So in 2013, the SEO practices we use today are very different to what we have used in the past. Um, and where they will eventually lead to. So the next half an hour will be um, my thoughts about how we look at those things. And when we did the last um, Let's Do Digital Summit uh, back in uh, last autumn, we had uh, Misha, who some of you will know, talking about Panda and Penguin specifically. Um, if you don't know what Panda and Penguin are, what the hell I'm talking about, I'm not talking about a zoo, I'm talking about uh, Google changes which have been given uh, animal names. So I'll... Um, I'll talk briefly about those and then also talk about how if you have a website and it's been penalized by Google by one of these um, updates, how do you adjust your website to um, counteract those changes? And then thinking, OK, once I've fixed some of my panda and penguin issues, what do I need to do in the next few years to make sure my website doesn't get hit again by the next update that Google will decide to do? So there's some advice and some ideas that you can take away and implement. Um, and we're doing a Q&A session. Um, it would have been, as I say, part of the, the talk, which was supposed to be at 11, but we're doing a bigger, I guess, smarter and um, more encompassing Q&A session. So if you are at this, the uh, search session at quarter past 11, hold your questions till then, and we can have some really good discussions about some of the things that I'm going to talk about here. So what are PMP, Panda and Penguin? Panda and Penguin are names given to a change to the way that Google operates. So the way that Google ranks websites that it knows about and across the whole world is due to what's called an algorithm, hence the picture. Al Gore, sorry. Um, so an algorithm is a basically a technical word for a piece of code written by some software developers that says, given these three, four, five words that I've got, what's the best information I can give back to the person who's typed that stuff in? So every time Google changes that secret source, that algorithm, that formula, it gives it a name. Um, and over the last 10 years, they've done many big changes. When they make a big change, they give it a name so, they, so that we can refer to it and understand, OK, on May 2013, it was to do with um, this change. So we've had uh, an update called the Vince update, which is about four or five years ago, which the idea behind that update supposedly was looking at improving brand credibility in the algorithms. So if you had a bigger brand, then because of the Vince update, you would start to outrank some of the smaller guys. Uh, Big Daddy was another update which was uh, quite uh, significant about three, four years ago, which again looked at how websites were ordered and the ways that the links, the content, and the other information Google had was started to be prioritized. And the final, I guess, big update that we need to um, consider is one called Venice. Um, this is one which I'll talk about in a minute, which the idea behind the Venice update was rather than serving you 10 generic listings, um, regardless of where you were in the country, Google would start to adjust the results based on where you were. So if it knew you were in Bournemouth and you were looking for accountancy, it would serve accountants in Bournemouth without you having to type accountants in Bournemouth, if that makes sense. So the search results started to get personalized based on where you were um, which comes from the signals of your mobile phone or your desktop. So that's some of the updates and why we have these Panda and Penguin updates. Um, the Panda update started in 2011 specifically looking at penalizing or reducing the value of poor quality content. So the way that we used to build links in the SEO world was to get a text link from one website to point to us. And website owners quickly realized if we build loads and loads of websites, then I can get loads and loads of more links pointing to my website, which will increase my popularity of Google, and my website will go further up the listings. Up until 2011, Google hadn't really cared about the quality of the content on those pages. <laughs> so if you had a website that was just full of mumbo-jumbo, loads of rubbish, an automated content creation tool you could create, 
and build all these websites, Google didn't really think about that too much. 2011 came along and the Panda update squashed the value of those. So here we see the Panda kicking poor content, which is basically what it was doing. If you had a website that had loads and loads of content on it um, and it ranked highly, you'd start to see that decline. Um, this actually, although it was really well intended and it did crap cut a lot of the, sorry, I was going to say a rude word, a lot of the rubbish out of the uh, search results, it did actually catch some website owners who were doing legitimate content, albeit not particularly good content, unaware as well, and that reduced their uh, ranking. So it's it continued to evolve over the last couple of years and will continue to do so, but a lot of the work there in terms of penalisation has been done. The bigger update which happened uh, last year was called the Penguin update. So I talked about Google's primary way of ranking websites is built around links. So the Adido website will have a link from our clients, it will have links from eConsultancy or any other good blogs that we uh, comment on or, um, or anyone that wants to mention the good work that we do in our community. We'll get a link from those people. If, you, if um, I was doing SEO three or four years ago, the, the number one thing I would do for my client would be building links to their website from other websites, regardless almost of quality on some occasions, because in those days, more links equaled better rankings. And quality wasn't really part of our thought, not so much anyway. We wanted to get as many links as possible. But the Penguin update came along and said, all of those poor quality links which have almost built the SEO industry for the last five years, we're going to start to devalue. And if you have links from those websites which have got poor quality, haven't been updated in three years, and they're just there to influence the algorithm, then you will get penalized as well. So this was a seismic shift in the way that the SEO industry started to operate. Um, and it continues to evolve to this day because Google will introduce this algorithm change and it won't necessarily work the first time. Some people will get benefits, some people get penalized when they shouldn't have done. So it continues to evolve. So why would you care about this Panda Penguin or, the, or Vince or whoever else it is has affected your website? Well, because of this. These could be your rankings for your website. And up until you know, 2011, everything was going fine. I had loads of good rankings, loads of traffic coming to my website, brilliant. All of a sudden, the Panda or Penguin update comes along and this happens. Your traffic will just drop because your rankings, which you've built using some um, different means, will start to be affected. And it may be that the, the, the algorithm changes and you get the rankings back again, but then it may all drop. So this is a game that Google started to play with website owners who are trying to get the rankings um, and by introducing these algorithm changes it makes it slightly risky as to how um, we view SEO. So we need a bit more of a, a well-rounded strategy to avoid any of these potential updates coming along and hurting us in the future. And obviously if we do get hit by these algorithm updates, ultimately that means lost revenue. Because why do I want my website to rank number one for a particular phrase? Because I want people to find it and if they find it and the website's good and I can click it with my finger on my mobile phone or however I get onto it, that should ultimately lead to a sale or an inquiry to my business. That's the only reason why we're doing this. So it all equals money. We have to make sure that our rankings are always there as much as possible to get the revenue that we need. So how do you beat Panda and Penguin? I'm going to give you a couple of things you can do to identify if you have or haven't been hit by the algorithm updates um, and things you might want to look at. So Panda was all about content, as I said before. If you have lots of content on your website and you don't perhaps know where it's come from, um, look at this tool here called DupeCop and it can like, give you some sort of feel of how um, unique your content is on your website. Quite often we see, for, certainly for e-commerce clients, they will have a database or a catalogue of information that their suppliers have given them. They tend to take that content and just whack it on their web page because it's nice and easy and it saves them a job. But guess what? There's 50 or 100 other people out there selling the same things that you are and they've done exactly the same thing. So if your content isn't unique, there's no reason why Google's going to rank you above someone else. So is your content unique? Check it using the DupeCop tool. But also if it's not unique, well, there's loads and loads and loads of pages with what we call thin content, maybe less than 100 words or 50 words you should start to maybe think about hiding some of that from the Google search engines. And there's some technical things you can do to do that. If you want to ask us more, there's the Q&A session. So don't copy and paste from other people. If you do and you want to have that content on there, make sure Google can't see it um, to make sure you don't get potentially penalized. And also the way to counteract that is to add, 
is to add unique content as regularly as you can. So if you have a blog, make sure you post to it regularly. If you have news or PR, make sure that goes on your website as well. That all adds to the uniqueness that you have. From the Penguin perspective of, of our looking at our links, if you have built links to your website, or even if you haven't and you don't know what links you've got pointing to you, you'll be quite amazed, I'm sure. Uh, but these are some tools that you can use. Uh, one is called Link Detective, which um, I think for one website is free. Uh, and you can see what type of mix of links point to your website. So if you've engaged an SEO company at any point in the last five or ten years, whether they're based in the UK or India or wherever else, um, they would have engineered links from various different places, um, from directories, from article sites, from forums, from blogs, etc., etc. This tool here allows you to see the mix of those, and if you have too many lower quality links, like an article or a directory link, then you might want to start removing some of those uh, or adding more positive ones um, through some good content that you've got. Open Site Explorer does a very similar job, but in, instead of looking at the type of link, it will look at the, the value of that link and give it a score out of 100. And if you have 100 links pointing to your website and 90 of them are a score less than 20, again, that's a signal to Google and the other search engines, don't forget Bing and Yahoo here, um, that you have too many links which are artificial and so therefore will start to devalue them. So I guess the acid test is, you know, do they look natural? Do they look of good quality? Has this website been updated? Does it, look, does it look and feel good? And I guess the ultimate test is, would you show the website that you've got the link from to your boss? If you've been getting these links from India and they cost you five pounds each for seven years or whatever it is, and it looks like a rubbishy website, and your boss goes, well, what links have you got for me? And the website doesn't look very good and you don't want to show him, that's not that's really the mindset you want to have about whether that link is good or not. If the website's from the, B the links from the BBC, which we've got one of those, then I'm happy to show my boss because that's all fine. So that's the sort of way we should be trying to very top level think about whether a link is good or not. And Google will look at also the profile of those links and the, the weighting of the, the optimised versus non-optimised. So if I am the BBC, I don't engage in link building. I don't need to get my rankings up because people link to me automatically. So a profile for someone like BBC or Microsoft or even, I guess, .mailer will be a non-optimised link because people will link to that website with the company name or the www or click here or read more or whatever it is because they don't need to get links with their target phrase inside them. That's a natural link building profile. It just happens that people link to them because they have really good quality content and it's built over a period of time. But the SEO industry went the other way. So in order to get my website for my, uh, to rank for the phrase accountants in Bournemouth, I would go off to other website owners and get them to link to me with accountants in Bournemouth or web design company or whatever phrase I wanted to rank for, that would be the link I'd try and get. But Google again changed it with all the Panda and Penguin updates, so we need to be looking at more of a natural profile of 80% non-optimised, something like 20% optimised links. Whereas in the past it used to be very much the other way around. So if you have lots of links pointing to you, and they all look optimised like this, you want to start to remove them or change them as much as you can. So those are a couple of things you can do if you've been hit by these algorithm updates to counteract that. So what do we need to do going forward? Okay, this is Panda and Penguin, but what about the next one? It could be the zebra or the giraffe or, uh, I don't know, the water vole or something, I don't know. How do we stop our rankings getting hurt? And also, what is Google trying to do at the moment? I've been in the industry for nearly 10 years and I've seen Google do a lot of, lot of really positive things. If you ask our support team, our technical team, they, would love, they love Google to death. And the marketing team is slightly different because we see the effects of some of the things that Google does. Uh, and I'll, show, I'll highlight some of them here. Um, so the Panda update is, is happening now. It's quite a fierce thing. It's very targeted at actually stopping artificial link building and artificial things happening to make websites rank. So it's being really aggressive on the SEO side of things. And Google, from their nice, fluffy corporate side of things, say they're here to make the world's information accessible and useful, which they do. You know, if I pick up my phone, I can look on a map and find where my local coffee shop is. There's a thing called Google Now. Has anyone used Google Now? Scary. It, basically predicts what you're going to be looking for before you've even looked for it. Try and get your head around that. I have not even used it, I don't want to. But they're trying to get all this information that's out there and give it to us and make it use, use, useful 
so that we keep using the Google products and services. On the other side of the coin, Google is a public listed company. You can buy shares in Google. So Google's, one of the other missions Google has is to deliver really good stuff to people across the globe to increase revenue for its shareholders. That's what it has to do. Otherwise, if it doesn't deliver revenue, then people aren't going to keep investing and they can't keep building this stuff. So it's a double-edged sword in some ways. So at the moment, the Google's an advertising company. It makes its money by selling adverts. Those little boxes on the right and above the, the listings, the pay-per-click ads, that's where it makes its money. But that's, in the long term, probably not going to play out very well. So it's looking at other things like Google Drive, which is basically trying to take over Microsoft Office, or Android, which is taking over mobile phones, or Google Glass. Does anyone know what Google Glass is? It's, uh, it's basically glasses, yeah, on my glasses are in my car. But put your glasses on, and you have a camera in the top, top right-hand corner, and it will project virtual digital information into your real-world vision to, again, make your life more, more easy, I guess, is the ultimate goal. But imagine walking into Costa Coffee and looking at one of the menu and going, OK, glass, I want a cappuccino, and it's paid for it, and then just gets given to you when you sit down. That could be the world we live in in a couple of years, all powered by Google. So it could become a commerce company, or it, who knows. But certainly one of the things that Google isn't really interested in is helping companies with their SEO. I don't care, Google doesn't care if website A, B, or C is ranked number one, two, or three in the listings. Not really. It helps from the users to get the best results, but for them, they don't make any money. They don't care about it. If you go to any event where there's someone from Google there and you ask them about SEO, they just, they don't, they just pretend that you're not there. They don't know anything about it. It doesn't exist. They're only there to talk about paid services. So Google's not really, don't really care about that. And if you look at the search results, this sort of is backed up by what I've just said. So pay-per-click listings are all above the fold. This stuff over here is also paid listings, and it used to be free until last year. Now it's a paid-for service. So if you type in chocolate fountain, um, you've only got one organic listing above the fold. Quite hard to get your website to rank, and obviously Google's trying to make as much money as it can. And also what it's doing to, I guess, uh, kick us while we're down is to hide the information that we used to get. So the SEO industry was really transparent a few years ago in terms of understanding what worked and what didn't. So if I got my accountants to number one on Google, and people were clicking on that free listing, and they were coming through to the website, my client was really happy. Now, if I have got them to number one, the only way I really know is by looking at the rankings that I can check with one of my tools. Because I can't see as much information as I used to about what phrases people have typed in to that search box to click on to get to my website. About a year and a half ago, um, a couple of years ago, a uh, year and a half ago unofficially, about a year ago in the UK, Google made a change to the way it gave us information. So if I was logged into a Google account before, my Gmail, my YouTube, whatever it was, and I did a search, then that search just went straight through into my Google Analytics and I saw that someone typed in accountants in Bournemouth to get to my accountancy website. As of around April last year, if I'm logged into Google Mail, I do the same search and I click on the link. Google now says, you're logged in. I'm not going to show that information to the website owner. I'm going to show that someone clicked on it, but I won't show the words. I'll just show not provided. So what this means is we've now got a black hole in our data, which is getting bigger and bigger and bigger. I don't know which words people have typed in to get to my website. All I can do is make an approximation. So it's very hard to understand what isn't de is it delivering rankings and what isn't. So Google's done us a massive favor there. By the way, one of the reasons why I've become skeptical, if I had paid for that advert on my pay-per-click accountants in Bournemouth and someone had clicked on it, I can get that information. They're happy to give it to me. But because I've clicked on the free listings, for some reason that's a privacy issue and it can't give us the information. I'm not sure I completely agree, but that's the way it is. Final thing to think about from an SEO perspective is Venice. So I talked about this very quickly before. Um, I've never been to Venice, but uh, I'd love to go. What Venice has done to, to our world is change things significantly, and it's personalized the results based on the location that I'm in. So I've uh, used the phrase cash for gold here, um, which serves me places in Bournemouth which sell, would allow you to sell your gold for cash. So there's loads of localized um, suppliers that do that. If I change my location to Manchester, 
I've got different people doing that service and I've also got a map now. So getting the ranking of uh, accountancy in Bournemouth might be good if I'm in Bournemouth, but if I do that in London and I want to find an accountant in Bournemouth who are, and I'm based in London, my listings again will be different. So we've got to really think about the location of our audience, how do we then engineer our website to give these local signals to Google and then try and make sure we measure the rankings as best we can as a result of that. So it's, it becomes a, a wider issue and a much more personalised uh, problem we have to try and solve. But certainly things like that are not helping from Google. Uh, and the final thing we need to consider is Google+. Plus. So this is again affecting how SEO is uh, performing as a channel, but also thinking about how we need to think longer term about these sorts of issues. So SEO just used to be getting the website to list here with the best ranking possible. And it still is to a large extent. But with things like Google+, Plus, we can attach our Google+, Plus profile to the content which has been authored. So I've written a blog post on my website, on someone else's website. I can attach my Google+, Plus profile to it, and I get a picture next to my listing. That picture is worth two or three or four places of listings. So if I'm listed here, I could still probably get more clicks than the guy listed number one because there's a picture and we're curious about people's faces and we always want to click on people rather than links. So we need to think about clickability, not just the rankings now. <coughs> so social plays a role in developing our Google Plus profile. It will show us how many people like us, how many, people, how many circles I'm in, how popular I am. Um, so the social plays a part not only in, in terms of getting the profile there but also in making that link more clickable than someone else. So we need to work on social and SEO at the same time. So what's the solution to all this stuff? Google's personalising things. Google's looking at social. Google's also pushing down some of the SEO results in some instances. How do we counteract those things and also the algorithm updates, which are also happening? There's a lot to cons consider. So the solution is um, based around an idea that uh, I heard last year, I went to a search seminar event where I wasn't speaking but I attended um, and there was a guy called Will Reynolds there. Um, Will Reynolds is the owner of an agency, search agency in America called Sear Interactive. He's a very, very good speaker and he came up with this idea and he used this hashtag of RCS. And that basically stands for real company stuff or in his words, real company shit. We got to do real company shit. You cut, his message was, you can't cheat the algorithm anymore. Years and years ago, go and buy loads of links, go and buy loads of crappy content, and your website will rank. We can't do that. It's not what a real company would do. It's not what the BBC would do. It's not what Bournemouth University would do. They would just build good stuff, and people would link to them naturally. And that's the way that we need to view SEO now and in the future. We can't be doing stuff just to make the website rank better in the artificial ways that we used to. So we've got to do real company shit, basically. And that's create real content for our audience as much as possible that they want to then start to share. So content should be at the centre of everything that we do from an online digital marketing perspective. It shouldn't be about how many links can I buy and how much budget do I have to do it. It does work and it continues to work to this day, but we shouldn't be relying on that. We should be thinking more content-based about how we build really, really good content that our audience is going to interact with. We should then be looking at doing the SEO things that have always been there and will continue to be there to make sure our website can get crawled by Google, people can link to it properly, it will work on all the right devices, there's nothing to block the search engines from accessing it. And then we need to be using social as the way of pushing out that content and the good technical stuff we've got to the wider audience. And if we know that there are people who are engaged online in the social networks we want to be involved with, we need to be sharing our content with them as much as possible and they will start to link to us naturally, which will eventually lead to better rankings. And also more traffic from those people. If I have a link from Bournemouth University and they, sh they mention us on Facebook or LinkedIn or Twitter, people will click on that link and come to our website as a result. So it's not just about the ranking, it's also about those people which are aligned to the ones I want to work with and getting traffic from them as well. So good content should really be a part of everything that we do, not only from an SEO perspective, but also from a social media perspective. They all overlap. Um, I hope that you're booked onto the social talk because Karen's got some really good stuff that she'll be talking about. But search is very intertwined with those things um, and you really need to be thinking about that. 
So you can't engineer or cheat your way to the top. It still might work now, but um, again, one of the points that Will made is that um, Google has the most people in the the company with the biggest amount of PhD students in the whole world working for it. So they've got some of the best minds that would probably scale you the amount of information they know and the ways they can work. Do I think that me, with my links from India and my content strategy that I've got, which is all artificial and aimed at cheating a system, which has been built by hundreds and hundreds of academics from, the, from across the world, is going to win? Not anymore. So if we have really good content, which we share with our audience, engage with people properly and earn our links through really being thoughtful but creating great white papers that people want to read, we'll start to earn links and that will get us the respect from Google and push us up in the listings. So we won't have to worry about Panda, Penguin, Pinocchio, whatever else is going to come along. We'll just get some good stuff and good traffic coming to us. So how do we make this happen? It sounds easy creating content. Um, but you have to be quite disciplined to make it happen. So you have some sort of editorial calendar. If you're going to go away from today and think, I, I do want to still focus on SEO, it's still going to bring me traffic, and not only that, I want to interact in a wider context with my audience online and social media using this content, then you've got to plan it ahead and make sure that you dedicate time to it, because it doesn't just happen. Creating good content can't really be done in 10 minutes. You have to sit down, really think about what are the challenges people have? What's the hot topics? How do I write content that people will be able to find useful and engage with? Once you have your content plan strategy in place, you then need to connect with people. So as I say, the only way your content is going to be shared, the only way you're going to earn links is by telling people about it. It's no good writing a, the best blog piece in the world about how digital marketing is evolving in 2013 you have to get people to read it. So you have to start interacting with people, connecting with people, whether it's LinkedIn, Twitter, Facebook, Pinterest, whatever it may be, you need to start doing that proactively. But don't think about, I have to do all these different channels. It doesn't necessarily work like that. And as, as the guys from Dotmeda talked about, when you think about digital marketing, it should always be about who is my audience and what are they doing? Just because Facebook is the biggest social media platform in the world with over a billion users, doesn't mean that my business has to be there. It could be that LinkedIn is the best place for me. It could be, in this instance, I'm B2C, and so Twitter and Facebook are the only things I really think about. But don't do everything just because everyone else does. Sit down and be rational. Sit down and look at what you can do and where your audience are and plan it out from there. So be choosy is my advice. But then also use some tools. So um, you can use Hootsuite or TweetDeck or whatever it is to manage all your Twitter accounts or your other accounts in a nice place and create, even create a schedule of tweets for the week and just post them all on Monday morning and they will all go out at certain periods that you set. It makes it easier for you. Follower Wonk is a tool that you can use to search Twitter bios. So if I am that accountant in Bournemouth and I want to find other accountants in Bournemouth and share content with them, I can type accountants in Bournemouth into Follower Wonk and it shows me all of the Twitter profiles and how influential those people are, and I can start to interact and engage with them on a one-to-one -one basis. So these tools can make us, makes our lives easier, and we also then need to report as to how good that stuff is done. So Google Analytics, free tool, it shows us how well our social traffic has performed, how well our organic traffic has performed, and where we need to make improvements. So these are some of the things you can use. But those are new ways of doing SEO. We can't forget about the fundamental things that always have to be in place. So if someone is going to type in accountancy in Bournemouth, which page do I want someone to visit when they visit my website? Do I want to visit my contact page, my testimonials page, my about us and my home page? You need to make that decision and proactively plan out your content around the phrases people type in and the pages you have on your website. So that's stuff we always are going to have to do and it should be the fundamental part of any good SEO strategy. So we still need to do that. We still also need to look at the technical things. So Google Webmaster Tools here can give us loads of stats about how well our website's performing from a technical basis, and those things are still count to making websites rank highly in Google. One of the things you might want to consider is page load speed. If your site's really low, slow to load, your website will get penalized, and you'll start to see other websites which are faster and more optimized outrank you, potentially. So always think about that stuff and also, also think about your code. Make sure you have the right tags in place. 
<clears throat> there's new ways to mark up data which makes it easier for Google to understand what content you've got and then start to reward you again with better listings or stuff above the fold. So all these things can, can all help. So don't forget the detail. But what I'm talking about is basically a fundamental change in the way that we should view SEO. So if you take nothing away from my talk today, just think about SEOs doing real stuff for real people and don't try and cheat the algorithm because it's not going to work. So the, way, the best way I can advise you to do that is by looking at content, invest lots of time planning content, creating really, really good content and then sharing that content with your networks um, and be selective. So choose your network that you want to work with, choose the people on that network that you want to connect with and engage with uh, and just make sure that you keep up to date as, as much as you can with all the things that are happening. If you do those three things here, fundamentally right, you will start to see your SEO change and the way you view SEO change, but the results should be far significant than just doing things how you used to. So that's my presentation about SEO 2013. I hope you've enjoyed it. There are obviously um, a Q&A, there's now going to be a Q&A session at quarter past 11, but some of the team are going to be in the next room for coffee and teas. Um, we've also got, as I say, Karen, um, who's at the back there talking about social and how ways that we can use social in our business. And Chris, over on the left, looking at some of the innovation stuff that we've been doing as a business and giving you some feedback about the way that we're all using technology and the ways that can be uh, improved and the ways it's coming into our lives. Um, and as I say, the other team, the team are around, so if you do want to speak to them about anything already mentioned this morning, uh, please feel free.